Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar of the Institute for International and European Affairs in, in Dublin. We're very happy today to be joined by um, Judith Varga, the Hungarian Minister for Justice, and Thomas Byrne, the Minister of State for European Affairs in Ireland, who have both been generous enough to take uh, time out uh, from what I'm sure are still busy schedules to take uh, part in this webinar about the rule of law in the European Union, an important and topical theme. The event is part of the IIEA's Global Europe Programme of Webinars and Research, and it's supported by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. I'd also like to give a, a special welcome and thank you to the Hungarian Ambassador to Ireland, His Excellency, Mr. Istvan Mano, for helping to facilitate this event. Um, each minister will address us for about 10 to 15 minutes. And um, we will start with Minister Varga, and then we'll move on to a moderated discussion uh, between the two ministers and finally finish up with some questions and answers from our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion via the Q&A function on Zoom, which should be on your screens. Uh, feel free to send in your discussions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them, or as many of them as we can, once the ministers have concluded their opening remarks and their discussion. All of today's presentations and the Q&A afterwards will be uh, on the record. So you can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're live streaming this afternoon's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining via YouTube. So now to our speakers. Judith Varga was appointed Minister of Justice of Hungary in 2019. She was previously Minister of State for EU Relations in the office of the Prime Minister. Before, this, before that, she had worked uh, as a political advisor in the European Parliament on environmental, public health and food safety issues with the Fidesz party. And she studied law at the University of Miskolc and was admitted to the Hungarian bar in 2009. So with her current portfolio in justice, uh, she is obviously very well versed in the rule of law issues. Thomas Byrne TD is the Minister of State for European Affairs of Ireland since 2020. And he has served previously as the Fianna Fáil party spokesperson on education. He represents Mead East in the uh, Irish Parliament, the Doyle. He was previously the party spokesperson on public expenditure and reform in the Senate, the Shannon, uh, and he holds an LLB, a Bachelor of Laws from Trinity College, Dublin, and is a qualified solicitor admitted to both the Irish and New York bars. He takes part in the work of the General Affairs Council, so is also pretty well versed in the rule of law issue, which has been treated on a number of occasions in that forum. So we look forward to the minister's presentations and above all to their discussion. Our time is limited given the, the broad scope of the rule of law topic and the amount of material uh, which is to hand already. So I hope we can enjoy real dialogue and interchange and with some attention to specifics. The European Union does have some issues in the rule of law area. We hope that today's work can get to grips with those issues and be a useful part of the wider overall rule of law procedure. Minister Varga, welcome to the IIEA, even if only virtually. The floor is now yours. Dear Mr. Gunning, dear Minister, uh, dear Ambassador, Your Excellency, and dear uh, participants of this webinar, I'm uh, utmost honored to take part uh, uh, in this panel discussion of your prestigious uh, institution. Uh, of course, I wish I would be there uh, uh, personally, physically, uh, and we could have a lively discussion in person, uh, although uh, we all enjoy the uh, digital age and all the improvements of uh, the technology that uh, makes it possible uh, to have a fruitful conversation. Um, since the topic uh, rule of law has been my topic uh, since my appointment in the Hungarian administration in 2018, uh, I was uh, happy uh, to uh, accept uh, your invitation. Uh, but in my introductory speech, uh, 
let me also uh, give uh, a hint uh, on our views on the future of Europe uh, debate and also uh, the general setting uh, where Europe uh, finds it now, according to my opinion. To have a lyric intonation, let's say that uh, set off from the shores of Greece, Europe is a ship on travel waters today. Uh, but uh, if you look back uh, the past 15 years, uh, we think that uh, we have uh, the impression as if a constant crisis uh, would be on in Europe. In 2008, we had the global economic crisis, then we had Euro crisis, we, we got migration, and now the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, Europe is in a constant um, crisis management uh, situation. And we can say that uh, the economic crisis has weakened uh, uh, in a way us and the migration crisis unfortunately divided us. And then came Brexit, which actually led the genie out of the bottle. And uh, it has also shown that people have real concerns. And, and if these citizens' concerns are left unaddressed, unanswered, uh, they will feel disillusioned about the European project. So it was a lesson uh, which uh, must be learned uh, and uh, make uh, use uh, of this lesson for the sake of the future of the Europe dialogue. Uh, we think, uh, I, can, I can say that the general Hungarian position on the European project uh, is based on the strong EU, based on strong member states. Uh, it, unfortunately, during the past decade, we have seen that uh, Europe has sort of lagged the strategic thinking when, when faced these ma major challenges, which I just listed earlier, the migration challenge, the COVID-19 challenge, or uh, any uh, external challenge, uh, and therefore uh, choose a reactive approach instead of actively shaping the global political area. So this is where we could learn. And uh, instead of uh, finding uh, reasons to divide our lines and uh, digging gaps between member states, we should focus on those issues which connect us, which uh, unite us uh, for the sake of uh, the fruitful project and for the success uh, of the European communities on a global field. And uh, the strength of Europe and the overall position in the international scene is uh, uh, directly defined by its relation towards the member states. A strong and effective Europe that is capable to assume the position of global leadership, which it is predestined for, based on its economic and political power. Because if we see uh, how strong we are, how much know-how do we have? Uh, how in, in many fields uh, like climate change, just to mention, or Industry 4.0, we, we can lead the world, uh, but we, we will only be to step into that role to, to lead, uh, to preserve this global leadership if uh, the internal conflicts are settled. And here I'm now approaching uh, the rule of law issue because this is one of the reasons uh, or one of the, the issues which are partially dividing politically, uh, the member states nowadays. I think the high time of this di divide was uh, last year's uh, uh, negotiations on the MMF and the MFF and the R RRF uh, negotiations so to adopt uh, the recovery package and the EU budget. And uh, I think this uh, historic agreement, which was made finally with the help of the uh, very pragmatic uh, German presidency should also uh, show uh, the way forward. And uh, we expect now the Portuguese presidency to implement that agreement, which clearly uh, states that no uh, link can be uh, made between budgetary uh, resources and political and ideological uh, expectations uh, from certain political uh, wings uh, of the European uh, political field. And one uh, uh, sentence about uh, our economic uh, policy position in the European Union, which is clearly linked to the whole uh, rule of law ideological debate is that we always fought for the united in diversity uh, to become a reality uh, in the quotidian, in the everyday life of, of Europe. It means that uh, national uh, policies uh, national uh, ideas and solutions should be as legitimate uh, when forming European policies when those policies which are coming uh, 
from Brussels. So here uh, we must remain free, for example, to choose the best fitting policy models for our unique social policy models, the economic uh, structure, uh, or uh, for example, when, when we try to tackle the, the historic challenge of migration, because there is no one size fits all. We must focus on coordinating our efforts by fully respecting uh, our national traditions, uh, our constitutional uh, establishments, which are all in each and every member state a result of uh, a long historic uh, development. So we think that the, the culture of consensus should remain uh, the leading uh, political principle. We see that uh, there are certain attempts to have the so-called two-speed uh, Europe, where those who uh, don't want to uh, uh, find or seek for consensus, uh, because they think this is just a waste of time. We think this is the preservation of the unity and, and the values of the EU. Uh, we, we would like to, to preserve the status quo. Uh, so that, that framework of culture, consensus, uh, the common or the shared or the, the national competences uh, framework, which we joined in 2004. And uh, whenever Hungary is criticized for uh, being stubborn uh, in uh, certain political uh, fields, be it migration, for example, or family policy or social policy, we would like just to ask uh, to stick to the treaty framework and preserve those legal uh, uh, provisions which define uh, which matters uh, belong to common and shared competencies and which, which matters should uh, remain in, in, in the national uh, uh, governments uh, and, uh, and in the citizens of each country's hands. Uh, so here I think we are facing a very interesting and uh, long-lasting debate on the future of the EU uh, conferences, which I'm so sorry to see uh, delayed because of the COVID pandemic. Those conferences are usually um, implemented through physical presence. Uh, in Hungary, the Justice Ministry already organized two conferences uh, with the participation of uh, Madame Schuica Dubravka, who is uh, the commissioner in charge. So uh, I think these will be the crucial issues. And now very, very short, in short, about rule of law in general, because I'm sure I will receive many questions about that. So I just save some sentences for, for the Q&A or for the discussion. Of course, the principle of rule of law is a basic value. No one ever questioned that. And, and my country is also firmly committed to the respect for the rule of law. Not to mention that uh, 30 years ago, our, social, our societies had to fight for uh, the rule of law so that it prevails when, when governing a country, when, when the state functions. Uh, after the regime change, it was a, a real achievement of, of this uh, uh, revolution, let's say, uh, uh, thanks God without any blood uh, in 89, uh, when Hungary just got rid of the, the communist uh, chains and the Iron Curtain fell in Central Europe. So our fundamental law uh, and the state structure of the country, or of Hungary, are all based on the rule of law. Uh, I, I often say it is like water and air us, no question, it is exists and it is everywhere uh, prevailing uh, in, the, in the operation of the country. And uh, it is also a constitutional heritage of all member states. And there is no general definition to the rule of law. That's why I, I prepared with the Venice Commission uh, quotation, because um, our critics often say that there is a rule of law checklist by the Venice Commission. Uh, why I, I'm saying that there's no definition. And I'm saying it as a lawyer uh, and as a minister who uh, listens to the professor's opinion, who are unitedly uh, saying that a rule of law is, is a concept. Uh, it is an ever-evolving concept. Uh, there is a very uh, important uh, traditional and historic element because in each and every country, we have a different path of uh, development where we got to the actual status of our uh, democratic uh, uh, establishments and, and uh, the special functioning of the rule of law in each member state. So let me give you an example. There are countries where, for example, the, the jurisdiction is uh, belonging to the justice ministry, but in some countries they are fully independent, even in the, in the administration and budgetary uh, 
questions. For example, in Hungary, we opted for, especially after the, the lessons learned under communism, uh, to the fully uh, independent model where there are the self-governing bodies of the, the judges who are deciding uh, on their own uh, issues. And there is just a, a, a dialogue uh, between other uh, branches uh, of the distribution of the powers. So the Venice Commission says that the checklist of the rule of law is neither exhaustive nor final. It aims to cover the core elements of the rule of law. And the checklist could change over time and be developed to cover other aspects or to go into further detail. New issues might arise that will require its revision. So it also states that uh, we have to be in dialogue. We need to have uh, proper, honest and bona fide information about each other so that we can have a comparative analysis and uh, we can share best practices, we can recommend uh, good models, which proves over time to, to function well. But in any event, can we divide member states uh, in two uh, groups, those who are the good guys and those who are the bad guys, because this tendency has been evolved over time. And uh, my final sentence is that uh, we all know that the Magna Carta, which is one fundament of European rule of law history in 1215 comes from uh, Great Britain, uh, so it, it was uh, made in 20, uh, 1215, so 1215. The Hungarian Magna Carta, I don't know when, whether you know, but it, was, it is dated 20, 1222. So just seven years after the British Magna Carta, we had the same document, the same deed to make the foundations uh, of rule of law uh, to function in central Europe. It is called the Golden Deed. And I would be happy to show it to you in person when you come to uh, Estego uh, one day. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you for setting your, your views in the wider context of the, the future of Europe. You, you've made a number of very far-reaching remarks. I think some of them we will want to pursue in the, in the dialogue after I give the floor now to Minister of State uh, Thomas Byrne. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, and uh, thank you for the Institute for the invitation to join this event today and indeed for all the work you've done in bringing us together in these difficult times and, and, and on a regular basis on, on different issues. I really commend the Institute for doing that. Um, and the amount of people who can now participate in these events online is significantly greater than if we had uh, if we'd been able to do them in person. <clears throat> um, I want to thank uh, Judith Minster Varga for joining us uh, and for outlining her position. The pandemic has given us all serious challenges um, and obviously the reduction in the in-person frequency of engagement is, 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 is not as serious uh, as some of the challenges we face, but it's still important, particularly in diplomacy. So I'm thankful for the opportunity today to have an in-depth uh, conversation online. So I hope in the not too distant future we can invite uh, Judith to, to Ireland in person again. Um, and I want to make clear, first of all, uh, despite differences of approach on this issue and, and significant differences, uh, we do have strong bilateral relations with Hungary. There are about 10,000 Hungarians living in Ireland and they make a very valuable contribution to our society, our culture and economy. And indeed, uh, our links uh, go back um, many, many centuries. Uh, there's a strong and growing trade link nowadays between our two countries, which our embassies and state agencies are doing uh, much to improve. So in the context of shared EU membership, in the post COVID-19 recovery and post Brexit, I'm sure there are many areas where we can build on our relationship going forward. So in, in the world of rapid fire and divisive arguments on social media, it's really important to have space for calm, constructive, reasoned discussion on these issues to build understanding of respective positions, uh, but to set out what we believe uh, to be the path forward. The rule of law is at the heart of the European Union's functioning and is obviously at the center of current debate in the, in the European Union and indeed beyond. I look forward to hearing from those online and I appreciate people taking the time to join in the engagement. Our understanding of the rule of law is, and we heard this from Minister Varga, sometimes we hear that it's a concept with no agreed definition. Our understanding is that there is a, a definable approach to it and it is, it is a concept uh, that is applicable. It's not a, a concept so elusive, elusive to be impossible to be held accountable to it. 
We don't believe that the rule of law is a nebulous concept. It's well understood and well defined. And we agree with the definition of the rule of law provided by the European Commission. The Commission has stated under rule of law, all public powers must act within the constraints of the law in accordance with the values of democracy and fundamental rights and under the control of independent and impartial courts. The Commission uh, further highlights some key principles, including legality, legal certainty, effective judicial protection by independent and impartial courts, separation of powers, of course, and equality before the law. And indeed, the Venice Commission, as um, Mr. Vargas mentioned, they've carried out extensive work in defining this rule of law. And this has included the development of the rule of law checklist. There are pillars such as legality, legal certainty, prevention of abuse or misuse of powers, equality before the law, non-discrimination and access to justice. And these are well known and well understood and well litigated concepts as well. So under the rule of law, no one is above the rule of law. The law applies equally and fairly to everybody. No one can be all powerful in such a system. There needs to be checks and balances, limits to power and accountability. And the rule of law not only protects every one of us, but also I firmly believe has been essential to the economic and social progress of Ireland uh, since our independence. It protects the rights and liberties of individuals and indeed of enterprises. It provides legal protection and space for a truly free, open and developing society. So under the rule of law, we are safeguarded from the consequences of unchecked power and assured that the broader interests of society are kept at the heart of policy making. The benefits of the rule of law seem so boundless, so obvious that sometimes it can be difficult to imagine a world where we would still need to argue for them. It is difficult to think that we would need to argue for something as simple as limits on powers. I assume we are agreed on that. We must continue to actively defend the rule of law in Ireland, the European Union and globally. And even when we think that argument has been won, we must continue to promote and protect the rule of law. And I think as Minister Varga has said, maybe in her criticism of, of an approach to this, that it's not, it certainly isn't a permanent state of being, being. Gains have been made and can be lost. Society changes and develops. Losses in relation to the rule of law are often quicker than the gains. But I think one important point to make is that no country is perfect with regard to the rule of law. And Ireland is not perfect. We all have areas that need to be improved, areas where our systems could be strengthened. There is always work to be done. And we've seen that in an extreme example in the United States recently, um, where the rule of law was temporarily overcome. But I think that they have shown uh, that they need to do work and it's difficult work when you need to amend constitutions. But our program for government highlighted our support for the European Union's values of cooperation, peace, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. The program for government states that we will strongly advocate for democracy and democratic values and the rule of law. But they're not new commitments. I mean, they're commitments that the founders of our state uh, adhere to very strictly. And indeed, uh, the, when the Fianna Fáil government came in in the 30s, um, Tish, uh, Eamon de Valera at that time stuck rigidly and throughout terms of office to the rule of law and respected uh, the judiciary, the police force in very, very difficult and challenging times for our country. Um, wrote our constitution, it was enacted by the people in the late 1930s, uh, at a very, very difficult time in Europe for the rule of law. Um, and I think that that has, those actions uh, of the various founders of our state have led to enormous social and economic progress, because you can always depend uh, on equality before the law uh, and uh, on the rule, respect for the rule of law and for the authorities. But that developed as time went on and our understanding uh, of what equality meant developed as time went on, uh, and our understanding uh, of the rule of law developed to the benefit of our citizens and our society. So Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union states that the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, respect for human rights, including the per, uh, rights of persons uh, belonging to minority groups. So in Ireland, these values were given the support of the Irish people directly through referendums. And that derives from our constitution. So Article 29 of the Constitution, 29.4 of the Constitution uh, provides that Ireland affirms its commitment to the European Union within which the member states of that union work together to promote peace, shared values, and the well-being of their peoples. And this is a fundamental article in our constitution. 
uh, allowing us to be members of the European Union. And that is the basis of our membership of the European Union, peace, shared values, and the well-being of our, all of our peoples. And that is why Ireland has firmly supported the rule of law as a core value of the European Union and will continue to do so. And respect for the rule of law is, is, is also vital for the credibility and functioning of our union. The rule of law is the cornerstone supporting mutual trust between member states, which is vital for the functioning of the European Union, not only from the point of view of peace and democracy and, and respect for rights, but also for the functioning of our single market and our economic progress. It is therefore very important, we believe, for the European Union to have necessary tools to monitor the rule of law across every member state and effectively respond to challenges as and where they arise. In particular, the Commission, which is the guardian of the treaties, has an important role to play in monitoring and enforcing the rule of law. When the Commission seeks to hold member states accountable to the promises they have made, this is not overreach or mission creep. This is the Commission's role and function, and we support it fully. We support the Commission in this role, even when it may not suit Ireland, and even in those cases where Ireland is challenged by the Commission. So based on our support of the Commission's role, we welcomed the publication last September of the first annual rule of law report by the European Commission. The report offers a comprehensive overview of the state of the rule of law across the European Union with specific chapters in every member state. So we believe the Commission did tremendous work last year in delivering this report in spite of COVID-19, which demonstrated a real appreciation of the importance of the rule of law in every member state. So in Ireland, we actively engaged with the European Commission in preparation of the report, not in a defensive way, but in a cooperative way, knowing that the work we would all do together would be to mutual benefit. We were fairly consulted and we welcomed the independent and impartial review of the rule of law in Ireland. And like every member state, we're always open to criticism. And again, I'm hoping in the near future to have a debate uh, in Parliament on the rule of law. Uh, and that will be uh, on the Commission's report, I hope, so that every country, and we, we may well be criticised by members of our own Parliament in terms of what the Commission has said about us, or there may be issues relating to other countries, but we certainly have no hesitation, no difficulty in looking into whatever issues are there uh, in, in, in our own country. So examples of areas that the Commission considers to be of concern in Ireland, and they, they have been difficult issues at times, the number of judges in Ireland in comparison to the European Union uh, average, rules on state advertising and media. And these are issues that have come up from time to time as, as political controversies, and they, they, need, they, they need to be and are being addressed uh, under the Republic of Government. Criticism may sometimes be difficult to hear for all of us, but it is important that the Council of the European Union has an objective basis on which to conduct its dialogue on the rule of law across the member states. The Commission is best placed to provide that objective basis. And we believe, in fact, and, and you know, Traditionally, the Commission, uh, as, a, as a small member state, we've seen the Commission as a, as a great protector, uh, not just only of small member states, but of the Union as a whole and the interests of the European Union as a whole, uh, which is where we get uh, our, I suppose, power, influence and, and access uh, to prosperity in the single market. So we're going to continue to cooperate with the Commission and contribute to, the, to their annual iterations of the reports, and uh, that's going to happen again, I think, very, very soon. We accept monitoring of the rule of law is not enough. As a union, we need to be able to respond appropriately to challenges as they arise. We already have infringement procedures uh, whereby member states can be challenged before the Court of Justice. These procedures are fundamentally uh, very important to hold us all and every member state to account. We've been open also to new initiatives to respond to challenges to the rule of law. We're also open to persuading our friends in the other member states of when, when particular issues arise as to uh, what we believe uh, their direction should be and to take to listen uh, to what their, their, their friends and colleagues in other member states may be saying. Ireland has strongly supported also the introduction of a strong and effective rule of law mechanism to protect our budget. And that is something as a net contributor to the European Union budget over the next few years. It is something that citizens in this country are very demanding of. So Ireland fully supported and fully uh, um, wanted um, uh, the best possible economic response uh, to the COVID crisis to ensure that other countries uh, wouldn't get left behind, indeed that we wouldn't get left behind because we realise the importance of the whole benefits each uh, and every member state. So when the whole uh, does well or when parts of the European Union are do, uh, can do well through stimulus to the, the, the recovery fund, Ireland benefits as well, notwithstanding the fact uh, that we are a net cont contributor. So the agreement reached in, this in, last, in December is a very important step 
to ensure that the union can respond more effectively to internal challenges to values we've all accepted as member states. It's not a perfect mechanism, um, but it does, for the first time, uh, bring that uh, rule of law conditionality in, 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 into our budget. So once it is introduced, Ireland will support a fair, proportionate, non-political and effective implementation of it. The EU has other tools at its disposal, such as Article 7, which I, 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 I know that that's a challenging topic and I'm sure um, Jesus will have a view on it. But it's important that we can speak openly of, of it. We, we fully support the continuation of the Article 7 procedures and we hope the discussions at council level can continue towards a constructive resolution. Between European Union member states, there have always been, and I'm sure will be, disagreements. There will always be frank and challenging conversations to be had. And in my short time uh, as minister, I have had those challenging conversations with other member states, but those member states are friends and allies uh, and stood with us very strongly, for example, most recently uh, in the context of Brexit. But it is still important to have those challenging conversations. Um, and I think that, that that is to all of our benefit, and I have no doubt that other member states will, 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 will have things to say to us from time to time. But, and I believe that the internal challenges that we all face can be addressed through dialogue. So today is an important event where we have the opportunity to expand on our positions in detail, better understand each other's views. Uh, this all forms a really important part of the process. I hope to shed some light on our position. I look forward uh, to the questions, which I'll endeavour to answer uh, in the best possible way. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Minister Byrne, <clears throat> and thank you for such a, um, an interesting and, um, and um, specific um, expose of the, the Irish position. I, I think if listening to the two ministers, um, there are points of commonality, but clearly there are, there are points of difference. And I, I guess the hinge in a way, uh, in practical terms, is now the handling of the report that uh, Minister Byrne has, has just uh, spoken about, the, the rule of law report from last year. Uh, the, hand, the, the Commission has done its work. It has passed the report to the Council and indeed also to, to the Parliament. Um, the European Council has done its work at the end of last year in uh, clearing the way for the MFF and the Recovery Fund, while at the same time coming to a I think it's fair to say a complex uh, agreed text around the regulation on, on uh, protecting the financial interests of the uh, of the union. Could I ask each or both of you, how now is the council? Minister Byrne, you, you sit on the General Affairs Council. Minister Varga, I'm sure you're involved in the follow-up to the report. How is the council of ministers going to uh, handle the, bringing, the, the taking forward of the rule of law report. Um, I think you had some discussion in the General Affairs Council last uh, October, but I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, I think there are discussions to take place seriatim uh, and focusing on various member states. Is, is that correct? And, and how do you see that? How does each of you see this process in the Council evolving? Either Minister first. Minister Varga, for sure. Budget first. Uh, See, well, Minister Varga, I'd be pleased okay. if you would. If you would Sorry, like. thank you. And then I take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, actually, it is in the hands of the Portuguese presidency to to direct the agenda. I haven't seen so far uh, the detailed uh, proposals uh, for the next GAC meeting, uh, but for um, from previous uh, projects or previous plans, we saw that there will be. Uh, certain uh, groups of member states who will be uh, analyzed uh, uh, in a um, semester. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, the next uh, uh, list of uh, countries uh, under scrutiny. Uh, we had a first uh, round of uh, this uh, dialogue uh, in October or November when I, uh, as I remember well, there was Belgium and uh, Denmark, uh, and Bulgaria on the, on the agenda. Uh, in this review cycle. But uh, coming back a bit uh, to the principles, uh, you mentioned that in both speeches, you saw some uh, commonalities and I really like this because I think uh, basically we don't differ in our opinions. I think the only difference is that uh, my country uh, besides Poland has so far the real and pure experience how in practice those rule of law procedures are working. 
and we have the real uh, experience how political uh, this tool can become. Because uh, there is no uh, doubt that I fully agree with all what uh, Minister Byrne has just said, that uh, rule of law uh, is uh, having those elements which, uh, which are one of our greatest values to preserve uh, and peace, democracy, freedom, uh, human dignity, non-discrimination, the full functioning of the state, uh, uh, legal protection, uh, equality before law. These are all, all accepted and well-known elements uh, of, of the rule of law concept. What I'm, I'm talking about when I'm saying that uh, it should not be used for political or ideological blackmailing, uh, then we actually uh, end up uh, with our differences because uh, it is so far Hungary and Poland who suffered from those uh, political procedures uh, under the cover of, uh, of rule of law. Because what we see whenever we engage in dialogue and uh, in writing or orally, we refute all the arguments and we explain why our uh, legal uh, methods or, or establishments in our uh, nation's uh, functions, uh, so and so, uh, there is no real answer, no real dialogue. There is only a statement that uh, there is something uh, wrong with you, but uh, no real explanation uh, to it. So when we come to the detailed uh, discussion, we see that uh, whenever we uh, have, a, have a political difference in positions, especially in migration, uh, we are not talking about uh, legal issues, we are talking about different concepts uh, about uh, the future of Europe. We don't think that uh, the continent should uh, get rid of its, uh, um, its uh, origins, uh, let's say, uh, why it became the best place of the world, and uh, it should be kept for member states uh, to decide with whom they want to live with. And whenever we have a legal uh, issue with the migration uh, dossier, for example, uh, we have infringement cases, but at the end of the day, there is a real difference uh, that we don't want to uh, make Europe an immigrant continent. And this is a difference of uh, political opinion. This is, not this is not a, a rule of law issue at the end of the day. The same what we think about the concept of the family, what we think about the, the role of uh, religion, what we think about uh, national identity. So. These are all different concepts, how, how a country uh, can and should uh, um, function. And democracy is one of the core values, of course, uh, of the European Union. It is also uh, a provision in Article 2 of the treaties. And uh, democracy is is very important value. It means that uh, citizens should decide on their governments and citizens should decide on their political uh, uh, directions uh, for a certain period according to the, the rules of democracy. This should also be respected. So if there is a different choice uh, in politics, uh, then it should not be uh, actually um, uh, in the name of, uh, of rule of law debates uh, to blackmail to change these positions. And unfortunately, we are, we are realizing this. And uh, this is actually the, the meeting point of two different uh, world uh, uh, aspects, uh, there are the progressives, and there are those who are preserving the status quo. And it does not mean that uh, the majority opinion uh, should not respect the minority opinions. So far in Europe, mostly the leftist, liberal, progressive thinking prevails, if you look at the governments, if you look at the landscape in Europe. So these are the majority of the governments, uh, mostly uh, liberal, progressive uh, uh, ideas. But uh, Still, uh, in some countries, we have conservative, we have uh, uh, non-liberal ideologies, uh, and this is just a minority opinion so far, but still a legitimate opinion. And uh, we still believe that we can fight for certain values to protect, uh, to preserve, and this is where all uh, those debates are arising. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, the Commission's rule of law report uh, which we actually said that uh, uh, it is invalid because there is no uh, treaty basis for the Commission to, uh, to prevail in this uh, rule of law dialogue because it is the member states intergovernmental issue where the uh, mutual respect can be preserved. Uh, that's why 
in our views, the rule of law report uh, and review cycle is not a legitimate uh, um, tool in the hands of the commission. Unfortunately, we see that uh, it is um, uh, using uh, double standards. Uh, it was a mere proof uh, in the September report. <laughs> I'd but like, unfortunately, I'd like, I'd like yeah, Minister, to, give, to give uh, Minister Byrne some chance to address the same question, right. if, yes, if you may, if you like. Thank uh, you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, yeah, right, thanks, taking Peter. forward um, of the of the uh, handling of it, but but also the fear, of the apprehension that the agreement reached in December may, may turn out to to lead to an impasse in the sense that the uh, the regulation. Uh, in all likelihood, will be sent to the uh, to the Court of Justice of the European Union. Yeah, and, and none of this uh, is easy. But I think I think the we've come really to the, the fundamental difference of approach in terms of what the European Union is doing. We we don't see it as political. Uh, we see it as absolutely essential. So we don't see the you know political bias. Um, we I, I would have to say though, um, in terms of the. Commission, sorry, the discussion at the council that can be that's difficult. Twenty-seven member states we're taking them in turns. We we will be discussed at April in April, and we'll have to listen to criticisms. Maybe due to a bit of some criticisms of Ireland, I don't know, but we will have to listen to them and take them on board. I think that's where that's that's that is very useful actually. Um, but it is difficult sitting around a table um, and and trying to in the limited time that's available, particularly online, uh, to discuss these issues. I think what what is important is. Um, that we follow what the, the council, I think, and, and the commission wants to do is have debates in national parliaments. I think that would be important too, because we can give a, maybe a greater airing uh, to the issues there and remind us what the issues are. I, I don't see this issue, though, as a debate between progressives and the right. I mean, political opinion, the whole point of the rule of law is that political opinion can exist within it. Uh, all shades of political opinion can, can exist within it. Uh, provided that we stick to the values of democracy in particular, uh, respect for the courts and, and free media. And uh, that allows um, independent thinking to thrive and for society to change and develop and for all points of views to be respected. And that needs to happen. So I, I don't see this as the, 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 this rule of law debate is not, it's a, it's a debate for the fundamental values of the union and for the fundamental values of our society, not a debate about particular uh, political viewpoints. It's a debate as to whether those particular viewpoints and, and the whole range of them uh, can, within the law, uh, can survive, can thrive, can promote themselves. And then it's up to the people themselves whether they want to accept those uh, particular viewpoints. And we've had lots of examples of, of that uh, in Ireland. Um, and they, that changes and develops. And, and certainly some conservatives don't like that. But they're in, in our system, they're absolutely free to put their own points of view to stand for election and uh, to have judges rule on issues not in accordance with um, what might be a political outcome, uh, but in accordance with what what the law uh, says, um, and I think I think that's that's where we make that's where we make the difference. Is we we do not see this as a political thing. We have been uh, we've worked very very closely with, with with Hungary and Poland. I think their their leaders have shown themselves very capable of working very closely with uh, European colleagues and, and in the Commission. Uh, for the benefit of our citizens, that's absolutely, you know, there's no doubt about that. We do work well on many issues, but on this, there is a difference of opinion and they, they've been set out um, fundamentally uh, by the commission. But I would also say this, and I, I keep coming back to this point, and I say this to our, our friends in other, in other countries as well, you know, if there's any doubt about the rule of law in your country, uh, any doubt about adherence to, to basic values, then I think uh, the very fact that there's a doubt there with the outside world means that you must respond, uh, because otherwise you will do damage to your image and that affects uh, your ability to do business, your ability to trade, um, and that's that's not what we should be about. So if anyone criticizes us uh, in terms of our fundamental values, in terms of how we operate our court system, we would take those criticisms very, very seriously indeed, because we as a small open trading economy depend on companies who want to come uh, to trade, first of all, trade with us and maybe set up business here, but they depend on legal certainty, uh, they depend on an independent court system, and, and that's what we strive to achieve. Um, so I think it's, it's not just for the societal uh, benefit, for the benefit of the people, but it's very much in our economic interest as well. Thank you very much. Um, well, look, uh, I think you, you helped each of you to uh, set out, I'm afraid, rather differing positions now on the specific issue of following up the report on the rule of law in the General Affairs Council, because 
one of one of them feels that the report is invalid and illegitimate. So I can only wish the General Affairs Council and its participants uh, the best of, of luck and effort in, in carrying forward uh, the work in, uh, in the months that remain. I think we have to turn at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, to give the audience uh, some chance to, to input their questions. Um, Minister Varga, you won't be surprised to hear that quite a few of the questions are specifically for yourself. Uh, perhaps you wouldn't mind, given the, the time that we, the limited time that we have, if I group three of them together, will that be all right? The first one is from uh, a writer for Politico, Lily Baer, asking about uh, the Hungarian government's, uh, she says, refusal to implement rulings from the Court of Justice of the EU. Um, that's one. The second question is uh, from the Financial Times, uh, Valerie Hopkins asks about your intentions, Minister, to submit a bill to regulate the domestic operations of large tech companies and, social, and that uh, social media sites limit the visibility currently, of, obviously, of Christian, conservative, right-wing opinion. So the question is, do you plan to implement a penalty fine for social media sites that remove or block posts which are not illegal? similar to an act proposed in Poland. And the third question for you is, uh, is uh, more historical, if you like, in the sense that the Central European University is no longer or has left uh, uh, Budapest for, for Vienna, I think. Uh, why, why has this taken place? Was it a, a, a case of intimidation uh, towards that university and indeed towards the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So some tough questions for you there, Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, I well know uh, these journalists. Uh, I would like to uh, read them from here. Um, so I will start from, from uh, the final question. Uh, the Central European University has made it its own choice to leave the country. No one has uh, actually forced uh, the institution to leave the country. And let me say that uh, the very uh, legal provision, which uh, was questioned by uh, CU, and we had the infringement procedure where we are now in a, in a phase of implementing the court decision, uh, made two criteria, two conditions uh, obligatory for those universities coming from a third country of origin, like from the US or from Indonesia, so outside of the EU, that they have to have an international agreement, a uh, bilateral agreement with the state of origin and with the state of Hungary. And the second criteria was to have a real uh, uh, effective uh, educational activity in the country of origin. If you check the Bavarian law, for example, it has the same two conditionality uh, for a third country university to establish a degree in a European, so in a Bavarian uh, state. Uh, so this is a, a legal issue here. We are in a dialogue with the commission services as always. Uh, so uh, what I say that there were outside of the center you went European University, other uh, academic institutions and uh, universities uh, in the same uh, legal situation and they all complied with the law. So right from the beginning, it was only the Central European University which made politics and political debate out of this, out of this uh, two legal provisions. Uh, I know Lily Bayer, uh, she is a constant critic of, uh, of Hungary in the political. I wish I could have the same uh, volume of articles every day uh, uh, for the Hungarian position in the political as much she has uh, every week. So the mantra against my country is mostly coming from, uh, uh, from Lili Bayer, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm fighting hard to get into political at least three times a year. Uh, uh, I'm often refused because uh, I just wanted uh, during the rule of law uh, dialogue uh, or this uh, veto uh, situation last uh, November and December to uh, appear with a with an article with an op-ed and I was rejected by the political because I was already that year twice uh, uh, in the political so this is about the equality of, of, of tools but uh, I would like to correct Lily Bayer uh, and I would like to ask her to to uh, present this uh, properly in every article that Hungary has always in every and each case fully complied with all European Court of Justice judgments unlike other countries, 
because there are countries who uh, instead of actually complying with uh, the judgment, they are paying the fines, not complying. So I would like to make it clear from a very, very important legal perspective that Hungary is always complying with every court of, uh, European uh, Court of Justice judgments. So uh, we never refused uh, to, imply, uh, to, to comply with the judgment. Uh, this is an ongoing, uh, well-established dialogue with the Commission services. In a, each and every uh, legal differences, what we had uh, in the past, we always got to a compromise, we always got to a, a common solution. This is up to the Commission legal services and the Hungarian uh, Justice Ministry. So I just would like to correct it uh, very harshly in the press. Hungary has always fulfilled the judgments, unlike other countries. This is this is fact. Uh, to Valerie, uh, hello Valerie, how are you? Uh, it's nice to hear from you. Um, about the social uh, media, yeah, I would also would like to make and ask you for the correct interpretation of my words. No one is talking about any kind of censorship. What I'm always talking about is to check whether the rule of law principle is still valid in the online world. So whether the tech giants are also operating in a transparent and fair way. I, it's not only Poland who uh, was uh, thinking about any kind of legal proposal. It's actually France, Germany, the European Union. So it's happening everywhere that uh, the seemingly arbitrary censorship exercised by the tech giants must be somehow uh, looked at because this is an issue for for a wide range of, of the society. So it's 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 uh, it's not only a, a question of the freedom of the speech, but it's also an economic question because many many economic actors nowadays are building up their businesses in the online sector. So if they are actually shut down for two days, it's a big economic loss for them. So it's a very complex issue, and I just would like to ask. Uh, Valerie, as well, in the Financial Times, to have a very correct interpretation oh. of the of the bill or of the projects. We are actually checking uh, how these tech giants are uh, uh, operating, whether it is transparent enough. The same uh, objective is there with the Commission. And I never thought that uh, on certain matters I will agree with uh, Commissioner Jourova. But she said that, uh, for example, she also thinks it's uh, she has concerns about the non-transparent. Uh, uh, operations of, of the tech giants. So this is this is all about the rule of law, uh, transparency, fair treatment, fair trial. So these are, I think, common values for all of us. Thank you very much. I have a question from Professor uh, Roland McRae at uh, University College London, uh, asking Minister Minister Varga uh, to respond to detailed criticisms of the Venice Commission on the question of judicial um, independence in Hungary. But could I? Well, uh, to bring some balance perhaps to the discussion, could I ask Minister Byrne first perhaps to um, uh, comment on the situation uh, in Ireland currently? We're, we've appointed, I think, a Judicial Council, but I'm not sure if it's up and uh, running yet, Minister. Yeah, and that comes under the uh, session of my colleague, uh, the Minister for Justice, and clearly we have um, a programme for government commitment uh, to make sure that the uh, this, this, this is upheld and uh, that we have an independent judicial council. Uh, it's not yet fully uh, operational, but uh, this whole issue again has been uh, of some considerable controversy within uh, Ireland. But I think it's fair to say that um, no government has taken a, a defensive approach to it. I think everybody has tried, and this is what I would urge our Hungarian colleagues to do, is to try to look at what is in the best interests of our, our country, the rule of law and our citizens within the country, but also as well to ensure that people outside the country can look at us and say, yes, that's a country uh, that we want to interact with, we want to do business with. Um, it is applying to, to international standards. And, you know, the, 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 for example, the commission identified maybe a, a reduced number uh, of judges in Ireland compared to other countries. Uh, and that's something that we'd have to, we'd have to take cognizance of and deal with. But what I would say time and time again is not in a defensive way um, or in, 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 in a way that denies that there's a problem, but, but in a way that says, right, how can we address this? Because many of these issues can be addressed relatively easily. Um, and sometimes we, 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 we agree on common issues or disagree fundamentally with them, 
uh, Judith on the issue of, 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 of on, on a point that I think she's made on tech companies, which that maybe right wing thought uh, isn't uh, promoted there. I mean, I think the, the evidence certainly in the States is the opposite. In fact, that right wing thought seems to be some of the most popular posts on Facebook, particularly in the last six months. Um, I don't know what the situation is like on, 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 in, 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 in Hungary, but um, we, we, we all have concerns about, 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 about tech companies and, you know, particularly, particularly, and I have to say, fundamentally issues of violence or um, bullying, for example, uh, and they are, they are certainly taking measures and there's always more can be done, but I actually, I think on, on the tech companies that should be done really uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a super national level rather than individually. Thanks, Minister. Mr. Varga, uh, if, if you would like to respond to the question about the Venice Commission's uh, views on, on uh, judicial independence. And I think also, if I'm not mistaken, there was a CJEU case in relation to the, the judge's retirement as well. Uh, the judges already not get the word. The, the retirement of the judges the back in 2000, and I forget, 2012 or 13, perhaps. Um, but the, the, the question was specifically aimed at the Venice Commission's views yes. on judicial independence. Uh, actually, I uh, cannot detect the, the special case because Hungary is in, in a constant dialogue with the Council of Europe and, of course, with the Venice Commission. And mm -hmm. maybe uh, the professor is referring to our uh, discussions and dialogue, uh, which are dating back to 2012, 13 and 14, when uh, we made the judicial reform and also the media reform. And through a constant uh, constitutional dialogue, we were fully harmonized with also with uh, the opinion of the Venice Commission. They are all go hand in hand with uh, European uh, Court of Justice issues and Venice Commission opinion. So we are uh, always engaged in this uh, in this dialogue, and uh, we were fully uh, complying, and we got the stamp from from the Venice Commission. So there are declarations. That's why we sometimes don't understand why in 2020 or 21, we still have to talk about judicial independence when our system was approved by the Venice Commission seven, eight years ago. So uh, this is also going against the very legal principle that uh, NEC BC them. So uh, when there was, there was already a, a decision by the court that you are okay, then why to open up all those uh, cases? And uh, the Hungarian courts, as I mentioned in my introductory speech, are one of the most independent models in, uh, in Europe, because in many countries, uh, for example, in Germany, Austria, uh, the justice ministry, so the executive, has a certain uh, influence and uh, connection and link, uh, constitutional link with the uh, 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 jurisdiction. Here in Hungary, we have no, actually, no interference uh, any constitutional, any practical, nothing, because uh, it was, especially after communist times, was designed in a completely, fully independent way, because this was the only guarantee to get rid of also the old uh, models of, of communism. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, uh, but if the professor has any specific yeah. question, she, he or she can uh, actually directly yeah. address us, and I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, we've, we've practically run out of time, but I have a good question that is directed to Minister Byrne, but I think uh, both ministers could, but very briefly to, to respect our time limits um, answer. And it is this uh, from Shona Murray of um, Euronews. It's actually to Minister Byrne, uh, but as I say, both could answer. Are you not concerned, Minister, that the violations of EU values, principles, and rules of law by Hungary, although might make the uh, question more general that the, the problem of there being violations of the rule of law within the European Union seriously damage the EU and its standing internationally and its credibility as an interlocutor on rule of law issues more widely. No, I, I, I don't believe that it damages the EU as a body internationally. I think certainly if we, if we were to ignore it and not deal with it, I think it certainly would. Um, I think certainly countries who are on the wrong side of rule of law issues are, are certainly damaged in their the perception of them internationally, and that is very damaging to those countries. But I think the agreement of the European Council in December, imperfect as it is, is a major step forward. Uh, and we now do have conditionality in the European budget. As I say, it's, it's not perfect, it's, it's imperfect, but you know, we, we, we have to deal with the circumstances that we have and the uh, procedural uh, rules that we have in terms of how these things were adopted, particularly yeah. the European Council. Um, so I actually think the opposite to, to what Shona says is that the fact that this is taken so seriously, that the 
you know, this is a major part of the discussion on the budget at the European Council, and there's a major result out of it, I think actually stands to the European Union's credit. Um, and I think that we do see problems with the rule of law across the world. Um, but I think the fact is that the European Union is actually, quite frankly, doing something about it. Uh, and that is in contrast to, to, to other states. And we'll see, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see what happens, particularly in the United States, where there certainly was it. I mean, obviously, there was an invasion of the Capitol building, the, the, the Houses of Parliament of America. Um, that's a serious violation of the rule of law. Uh, and they would have to take action in relation to that. Um, and we'll see. But, but this is a problem the world over. I think the world will not thrive, will not survive, uh, unless we're governed by the rule of law. Yeah, well, Mr. Barger, you will have the, the final word. What do you think about the standing of the EU and its uh, its mission under the under the treaty? I think it's the second or the, the third article, if I'm not mistaken, to promote its values in the wider in its wider international relations. How do you do you see any difficulty uh, for that task from the debate that we're just talking about, and also indeed from what Minister Byrne has referred to the changes that are that are taking place in the international order, not least at the moment in the United States? Uh, well, it's a very wide question. It's a final, uh, it requires uh, more than a final answer, I guess. It requires another conference for a uh, discussion. I would be welcome I'm to afraid. do that. In, in I'm afraid. Of course. But of course, as, uh, uh, as journalists, a uh, uh, question uh, in, con included that uh, we are a community of values. Of course, we are a community of values. So those who want to join, they, they have to share these values. So uh, I think this is this is evident, uh, but uh, I usually say in the foreign policy that uh, we are mostly collecting friends, not enemies. This is the principle of of, uh, of our foreign policy. So the cooperation and the mutual respect uh, has to prevail as well, uh, instead of uh, lecturing uh, other countries or lecturing the world. I think this is uh, this is very important in international policy. To be respectful towards uh, everyone uh, and have a uh, and strive for dialogue and mutual cooperation and compromise and understanding. And let me just come back to, to the question of uh, the Euro News or, or European Voice. I'm sorry, I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but at least the presumption of innocence should prevail, uh, especially when uh, journalists are actually defining the rule of law situation in member states. I used to live in Brussels for nine years and every morning I'd opened up the daily news and the hunger bashing was, was pouring from the articles. So I think in a perfect world, especially a perfect world ruled by rule of law, uh, it should not be the media who decides who is a, a good country and who is not a good country. It should be independent courts or international fora like the Venice Commission who decides on uh, who is uh, right on the path of, of uh, towards rule of law concept. So uh, you know, Thomas just said uh, that it has a, a very pragmatic aspect, how rule of law functions in a country. And I fully, fully agree with him. Uh, the economic uh, factor, not only the social, not only the, the legal factor, uh, how investors are coming to a country, how uh, they feel uh, safe uh, when it comes to the investments. And I can uh, happily tell you uh, that uh, foreign companies are happily living and investing uh, in safe uh, environment in Hungary. Uh, it is a very, very active environment now, uh, especially Central Europe is having a very, very good dynamic today. So I often tell to my critics, please come to Hungary, please settle down, pay your taxes for at least 10 years, enroll your children in our schools and universities, and you will enjoy living with us because this is who we are. And sometimes we are bluntly honest and having a very firm position on certain European issues. But in any case, uh, we are very pro-European country and uh, we are doing not something different but every other country protecting our interest in cooperating with others. So this is my final. Message. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, Thank I, you. I'm just in wrapping up, I'll just repeat the three words that you opened with, respectful, dialogue and, and cooperation, because I, we've managed today a very, uh, I think a productive discussion on what is a, a tricky, sensitive, neuralgic even um, topic. And for that, I want to thank uh, both of our ministerial uh, participants in particular. I want to thank, of course, our, our IEA production team who have brought it all together, the Hungarian ambassador for facilitating the event, 
and indeed our audience for their participation and for their questions. Thank you all very much indeed. I'm looking forward to um, the next uh, IEA event on this um, uh, Global Europe topic. Thank you very much for, to Thank everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Gunning. Goodbye, Thomas. Thank you. Goodbye, Judith. Thank you. Okay.